Thank you for joining me this morning. I want to continue in our study looking at really probably an often neglected uh, study, um, that being the subject of church discipline. You know, so far in, in our study, we've explored discipline uh, generally. And then from there, we looked at that situation that arises sometimes when a brother sins against a brother. And we went to Matthew chapter 18, where Jesus uh, gives us the divine prescription by way of handling um, that situation, uh, a situation that needs to be dealt with, must be dealt with out of, uh, out of love for one another, out of love for our brother. You know, when we've been sinned against, we go to them. And if that doesn't work, we, we take two or more with us to confirm the facts, but also to appeal for, for repentance and, and, and restoration. And, and if that doesn't accomplish our goal of, of restoration, we are, to tell it to the church, uh, that situation again, dealing uh, with those private situations that, that, that will arise um, between brothers. And, and then from Galatians chapter 6 last week, we, we looked at a, a slightly a different scenario. A brother or sister finds themselves in sin. It's a known thing. And Paul, led by the Spirit, he, he implores those who are spiritual. Now, now, remember, we defined those who are spiritual in that context as those striving to walk by the Spirit, allowing the, the Spirit to lead their lives through the Word of God. In the context, the, the previous chapter, laying out the fruits of the Spirit as opposed to, to, to those walking and, and defined by the flesh, um, we're to approach our, our brethren who ha have fallen into sin. We were to do that with humility and gentleness, looking to ourselves. Um, ultimately, uh, treating them um, as we would want to be treated if the situation uh, was reversed. And, and brethren, one of the things that, that, that we've been emphasizing, and we're going to continue to emphasize um, throughout this study, in both of these scenarios, whether they be public or private, this is all about restoration all about bringing the one in sin to a point of repentance, re restoring their, seven, their, their, their severed relationship with others possibly, but always by way of restoring their relationship with God. And brethren, you've heard me say this before, and, and I will continue to say it. We can never be okay when our brethren are not right with God. We can never be okay with that. We, we, we can't just turn a blind eye uh, to sin. We, we, we can never be content to pretend that everything is okay when it's not okay. It's never okay when a brother or sister is not right with God. Now, I, I think we've avoided this subject over the years, possibly, and just kind of put it on the back burner because um, I think it's possible we just haven't seen it for what it is. A discipline is not about hurting someone, um, inflicting pain on someone. It's not about humiliating others. It's, it's not about kicking anyone out. It's, it's none of those things. A discipline, as we noted in the first couple of classes, a discipline by its very nature in scripture is all about instruction. In, instruction involving the communication of what works and what doesn't work as God has, has given that direction in its word, but it's also corrective in its nature. Sometimes things are not right, right? And, and they need to be made right. Discipline is about making what is wrong right, but ultimately it's about saving souls. We, we can't ever lose sight of that. Nothing should be more important to us than playing our part as God defines our part by way of saving souls. So when it comes to church discipline, withdrawing from the brother or sister who persists in sin and refuses to repent, why do we sometimes avoid it? Why do we neglect to talk about it, preach on it, teach on it. And why is it controversial? You know, obviously, there's a lot of different answers uh, to those questions. And I'm sure every single one of us, we, we all have opinions as to why that is. But one possibility that I'd like to just briefly explore as we begin this morning is the possibility, um, just a lack of faith right? That's not easy to say. You know, sometimes scenarios arise when God's commands, well, there's, he commands of us something that, that just doesn't, well, it doesn't make sense. Uh, consider the command of baptism for the forgiveness of sins. Well, why do so many seemingly educated and intelligent 
I'll even go as far as saying many times good-hearted people struggle with that command. Why, why do so many ignore that command and, and even go to, to great lengths in, in their passionate insistence that, that baptism is not necessary? You know, I, I'm convinced that after many conversations over the years with, with people that I love, at the end of the day, it simply doesn't make sense to me. And, and, and what they found, and they're not alone in this, it doesn't make sense to a lot of people. So they simply ignore scripture and change God's prescription by way of accepting his grace. And I think all of this stems from it simply not making sense. At the end of the day, I would argue that's just a simple lack of faith. Now, that's just one example. Now, I truly believe when it comes to the idea of church disciplines, we're going to see this idea of brethren withdrawing socially from, from brethren who persist in sin especially in, in situations where we have long established relationships, even familial relationships um, that oftentimes transcend our relationship, even as brethren. I think you understand what I mean by that. We, we just can't see how withdrawing from them socially could work by way of restoring them. And I think if we're honest, when it comes to this subject, we've had those doubts, right? Will this really work? Is this really the best way? You know, I would argue that these are true tests of faith. When God commands something we don't like, when God commands something that's going to cost us something, or it's going to change something, when God commands something that doesn't make sense to our human minds, what then? Is that not the ultimate test of faith? Now it's decision time. Are we going to go with emotion? Or are we just going to simply do it God's way, by faith? Are we going to insist on our own will, walking by sight as opposed to faith? And brethren, not limited to this issue, but is, is that not the great issue of life? Whether we're going to walk by sight or walk by faith? You know, Brother Rader, in, in his book, he, he spends an entire chapter dealing with uh, what he calls misconceptions by way of, of this command to withdraw. And I found it really helpful. So what I'd like to do this morning, in, in the next class, we're going to get into the text there in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. But what I want to do this morning is just impress upon our mind, really, from two different instances in Scripture, the command to withdraw from the brother or sister in Christ who persists in sin and refuses to repent. And then I want to explore some just popular uh, misconceptions that, that maybe we have felt, maybe we have thought, maybe we have certainly a uh, heard expressed from others, um, and even maybe some that we've struggled with over the years, and try to clear up um, briefly this morning some of those misconceptions before we move on. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we have a situation where sin is persisting, in uh, a grossly immoral situation. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, you have your Bibles, grab those. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, at, at verse 1, the Bible says, it is actually reported that there is immorality among you. An immorality of such a kind as does not even exist among the Gentiles. Listen to this. That someone has his father's wife. Now you've become arrogant and have not mourned instead, so that the one who had done this deed would be removed from your midst. Uh, Paul describes, and, and I think this is interesting, Paul describes their unwillingness to deal with this sin by way of removing or withdrawing the one from their midst. Um, in coming classes, we're going to spend some time with exactly what that means. But I want you to notice and appreciate that Paul equates this unwillingness to obey as arrogance. Uh, that's important. Hold on to that. You know, over in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, another instance we're going to spend some time with in coming weeks. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 at verse 6, I want you to listen to Paul's command as he's, he's led by the Holy Spirit. He says, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from every brother who leads an unruly life and not according to the tradition which you received from us. That's a command, right? You heard the command. So the question becomes, why do so many have little regard for this particular command? While insisting diligently, as they should, with other commands. Well, let's explore some, some misconceptions or, or common misunderstandings this morning when it comes to the command to withdraw from the erring brother, the erring brother or sister who refused to repent. Uh, number one, maybe you've heard this, withdrawing, well, that's kicking them out of the church. Have you, have you ever heard that? I was kicked out of the church, someone says. You know, that's a misunderstanding that I think we've all heard, possibly even... Um, 
possibly even we've thought this ourselves. You know, I know for certain that there are those who have been withdrawn from that have been left with this impression. You know, first of all, as the church, we don't have the authority to do that. You know, over in Acts 2, when Peter and the apostles preached Jesus and the gospel message fell on honest, good, and receptive hearts. After asking what they needed to do, Peter, led by the Holy Spirit, he told them to repent, be baptized for the forgiveness of their sins there in verse 38, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. If you drop down to verse 47 in that text, those who repented and were baptized, God added them to his eternal kingdom, added them to the church. Same idea there. God does the adding, not us. Therefore, we don't have the authority to kick someone out of the church. God does the removing. Now, that being said, as the church, we are to remove the person from our midst. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, at verse 13, but those who are outsiders, God judges. But then he says, remove the wicked man from among yourselves. What we're doing is withdrawing ourselves from the unfaithful, the persistent in sin who refuses to repent. As we read there in 2 Thessalonians 3 at verse 6, Ephesians 5 at verse 11 tells us that we can't maintain fellowship with darkness. Now, now here's the key, and this has been our emphasis. Our goal is not to kick someone out. Our goal is to bring somebody back. <laughs> so, so number one, church discipline is not about kicking someone out. It's about bringing them back. And, and maybe we need to do a better job possibly of communicating and even emphasizing that to the erring brother or sister um, that we're dealing with. Uh, how about this one? When we withdraw from a brother or sister, um, they're forbidden to, to, to enter or to attend our assemblies um, together. You've heard that? Well, let, let's clear this up. You know, nothing could be further from the truth. In, in fact, we would encourage and, and welcome the Aaron brother to attend, to continue to study, to continue to learn. Uh, again, if the goal is restoration of that brother or sister's soul, of course we would encourage them to attend our assemblies together. But, but doing so, it would be our prayer that they would come to a knowledge of truth, return to the Lord where, where they would be met with open arms, met with love. And if that wasn't the case, now we have a new situation that needs to be addressed, right? Not with the once erring brother or sister, but with the brother refusing to, to love and forgive their, their newly restored brother. So let's put that misunderstanding to bed. What about this one? This may be the most popular when it comes to this subject. Uh, simply, and we, we, we talked a little bit about this earlier, withdrawing from the erring. It, it just won't work. You know, back as we discussed this earlier in class, we, as the people of God, we, we have a choice. Are we going to do it God's way? Or are we going to insist on our own way? You know, I understand based on a human assumption, um, it, it's easy to allow ourselves to go down that road just saying, you know what, it's just not going to work. Um, how would you answer this uh, misunderstanding? You know, I think first and foremost, we don't obey God with any command based on whether or not we think it will work. That's not our role. You know, as a preacher and a teacher, if I only preach sermons that I thought the audience would respond to with 100% obedience immediately, I would never preach. But that's not my role to ascertain that. My job is to preach the whole counsel of God. My, my job, that command is not predicated on another's response. You, you know, as a Christian, we're commanded to tell people about Jesus. Regardless of how one responds to that message, it's not predicated on the response. Our role is to tell people about Jesus. And here's the thing with these two examples. You know this. Not everybody's going to respond favorably, but it doesn't absolve us of our responsibility to tell them. You know, I think it's the same with this command we're dealing with. If history is any indication, um, some won't respond. Some will reject our efforts. Their hearts won't be right, and they want to persist in sin. 
God gives them that choice. They, they have freedom of will. While the response doesn't bear on our responsibility, I'll just know sometimes brethren do respond the right way. They do come to the realization of their condition. They recognize that this is an act of obedience and love on their behalf. And they return to the Lord. They repent. This exercise brings to light the severity of the situation that, that they have gotten themselves in by way of their sin, and they repent. That's what happened here in Corinth. The, the church in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 was told to withdraw, and they did. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, starting at verse 3, the Aaron returned. So don't tell me that. It never works. You know, I've personally seen this response on the part of the church in the Aaron, and it's beautiful. God is pleased. It's wonderful. We rejoice and we welcome them back and with open arms. It's a faith building exercise, no doubt. But let me say this, just because someone doesn't respond in the right way to the church exercising God's will and obedient faith doesn't mean something doesn't work. You know, in the context of the subject we're dealing with, it has another intended effect. By dealing with sin, dealing with the brother or sister in sin, it sends the proper message in regards to sin not only to the church, but to the world in, in general. You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6, Paul says, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Clear out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are, in fact, unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, also has been sacrificed. You know, as the Lord's church, we can never leave others with the impression that sin is okay. Paul talks about this leavening influence of the spread, if not dealt with. Well, what about this one? Withdrawing from a brother or sister persistence in was just unloving. You ever heard that? I don't want to spend a ton on, on this because I, I, I think the mature audience that you are, I, I think we would all recognize that this is a gross misunderstanding of love. You know, the atheist, the atheist denies the existence of God because, well, bad things exist in this world. And even bad things happening to good and even those who, who, who may claim to belong to God. Um, so the argument goes, how could a loving God allow hard and even bad things to happen to good people? Um, I would argue that's a, an immature perspective by way of love. You know, passages like, like Hebrews 12 argue just the opposite, to the point of saying that God disciplines those he loves. God allows hard allows bad things to happen to those he loves because it's ultimately for the best. You know, the atheist argues, how could God allow hard things in the lives of his people? And God responds, I think ultimately in scripture, how could I not? If God shielded us from all things hard in this life, would we ever long to leave and to go be with him? Would our faith ever truly grow if, if not tested? You know, as parents, we understand, I hope, the value of discipline when it comes to our children. At times, correction needs to happen. And what do we do? We punish, we take things away, we instruct, we correct. Why? Because we love them. It's what they need. And we'll have more to say about this, but certainly this applies, I think, in the subject of church discipline. I would argue we, we love not when we refuse to act in the best spiritual interest of another. And I'll just say this, God knows what is best for his children, right? So therefore, to refuse to obey this command, I would argue, is the ultimate lack of love. One more. Some say, well, we can't be friendly or even kind to those who have been withdrawn from. Now, this is a gross and potentially damaging um, misunderstanding. But what about those instances where we run into someone who's been withdrawn from, maybe at the mall or maybe at a restaurant? Um, are we to put our heads down and ignore them, shun them, pretend like they don't exist? You know, the actions commanded in 1 Corinthians 5 and 2 Thessalonians 3 to remove from our midst or to not keep company uh, with them. You know, these actions in, in no way restrict one from acting with kindness to showing them love or encouragement. You know, in fact, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 15, I want you to look at that passage. We're going to have more to say about this in coming classes. But in 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 14, if anyone does not obey our instruction, he says in this letter, take special note of that person. Don't associate with them so that he will be put to shame. 
Look at verse 15. Yet do not regard him as an, as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Don't regard them as an enemy, Paul says, but admonish him as a brother. Now, now certainly our association is not to go on as normal. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 5 uh, talks about not even eating with them. It's a social withdrawal. But that doesn't mean that we're not concerned. It doesn't mean that in giving those scenarios that I just brought up, that as the people of God in all situations, that we shouldn't be kind, that we shouldn't be a loving, especially in situations such as this. And there's a difference in this and continuing along socially, eating together, hanging together, acting as if everything's perfectly okay when it's not. Brethren, again, they're not right with God, and that's never okay. But in no way does that restrict love and kindness. They're not our enemy. We're to admonish them, to encourage them as a brother. So with all that said, if you get nothing else out of this this morning, please get this. This command to withdraw, um, this is all about bringing our brother or sister back. It's all about restoration. God's way, brethren, is best. So I ask the question, do we really believe that? Now, next week, we're going to dig into 1 Corinthians um, chapter 5. From there, we'll go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. We're going to explore a number of passages um, in our New Testament by way of this subject. Um, it is my intention to encourage us. It's my intention to remind us of what the Bible says on this subject. And I, I, I'm certain that we can accomplish that and that goal together. Thank you for joining me this morning. Would you pray with me, please? Our Father in heaven, Father, we are so thankful. Father, we, we recognize that, that at times, um, Father, some of your commands for us in the moment, by way of emotion, by way of relationships, Father, we recognize the difficulty um, sometimes in and then adhering to your commands. But Father, we, we ultimately recognize that, that your way is best and for your perfect will, Father, that, that guides us, and gives us direction, Father, we are so thankful. Father, we pray for, for stronger faith. And certainly, Father, we pray for, for those who once were among us and now are not, those who have chosen to um, have chosen a, a path of worldliness and sin. And Father, we just pray that, that their hearts would soften, that the things that they have learned in the past, that they would come to their mind, that they would see the world for, for what it is, and they would consider the temporal nature of the things of this world. But the lasting nature, Father, of eternity Father, bless them. Give them clear understanding. Give them the courage to come back to you. Father, we pray for opportunities to, to be a part of that. Father, as your church, we recognize your authority. May we always be humble. And simply do this as your word has laid out for us to do. Father, bless your people at Kenwood. In Jesus' name we pray.